I, for one, am a fan of Stanley Kubrick's final film, Eyes Wide Shut, but I think that both of us can agree that the title sounds like the title of a student poem. I, I like the title. Well, I think it's a bad movie title. Let's talk about some other bad titles of movies. Ballistic, colon, X versus Sever. That is a really bad title. That title makes my tongue feel ugly. It sounds like a title that was written by committee. Have we considered a dash instead of a colon? <laughs> Talking about really boring titles, uh, The Room. That's complete lack of title. Yes. Well, but Room... Exactly. Is an interesting title due to the lack of... The article. The article, Somehow, yes. taking away that the elevates it from the commonplace to the enigmatic. Mm -hmm. Room means something to the child. The room means world. While you watch The Room, and you're like, there's two rooms. What room are they talking about? The room where everything happens, or the room where the ending happens? <laughs> <laughs> there's a movie that just came out this past year, which is a really good movie. And they called it Slow West. Why didn't they just call it Boring West? <laughs> it's a title that gives such a negative connotation to a movie that's not a bad movie. What's one of your favorite movie titles of all time? My all-time favorite title is The Loneliness of the Long Distance Runner. That's a pretty good one. Yep, but that could have been called Slow Movie. Do you identify with that title in some way? Uh, no, I really don't like running. I never have. Me neither. I will never watch that movie. What? I've got a bunch of movies that I've never seen before. You don't know what they are. Every episode, I'm going to spring one on you. It might be good, it might be bad. We'll watch it and talk about it. Welcome to The Basement. June is animation month here in The Basement, or as viewer Nick D'Angelo calls it, Cartoon June. Thanks, Nick. Hey, that is good. For this month, I've decided to let Craig pick all two of the movies that we'll be watching. These have to be feature length. Yes. And they have to be all animated. None of this live action mixed in. As far as I know, this is live action. No. <laughs> I'm sorry. Wait, live action means cartoons, right? As far as I know, this is entirely cartoons. The most pervasive and popular trend in... The most pervasive and popular trend in film today is the superhero movie. And though roughly 150 are released every weekend, we have yet to invite a superhero down here to the basement. He is vengeance. He is the knight. He is Batman. Mask of the Phantasm. <laughs> I was hoping you'd pick this, because now <laughs> that guy who loves this movie can finally be put to rest. Yes, yes, your watch now is over. <laughs> Whoever the guy who's been recommending this movie to us since, I think, before we started doing the show. I have not seen this, but I love Batman. Released in 1993, directed by Eric Radamski and Bruce Tim, B, colon, M-O-T-P, stars Kevin Conroy, Dana Delaney, Mark Hamill, and Stacey Killer Kane Keach. This feature-length adaptation of Batman, the animated series, was slated to go straight to video, but during production they threw a few extra dollars at it and give it a theatrical release. Batman's parents were killed after watching a movie. I hope nothing bad happens to us. Or after an opera. There's so many different versions of no, this No, it was a movie. Mark of Zorro, I think, was the movie that's oh, that makes most sense. popular on the marquee in the various uh, Batman mythologies. All right. Joe Let's... Chill is the man who killed the, the Waynes. If you look to your left, there is a box. For me? For you. Now, we're going to be learning more about this night you love so much. I thought you might like to learn a little bit more about a different night. Oh, a green night. A book! Yeah, and Sir Gawain. I don't care about him. All I care about are the knights. Well, why don't you move the statue on the mantelpiece and wait for the door to slide and then jump down the pole to get to the back cave, which we call the old leather couch, to watch Baskman. Baskman. <laughs> It was going great. He's a Basque separatist. Uh, go to ETA! Uh, <laughs> to watch Batman, a mask of the phantasm. Da 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 Whatever language this is, they're singing about Batman. Coming through the night, gonna make things right. That's what, that's how, that's the translation. <laughs> it's nighttime in Gotham City. Chucky Saul is looking to launder some counterfeit money through the casino. When his little illicit meeting is broken up by Batman. He comes in and does his thing. He goes, whoosh, 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 throws the things around. Chucky Saul escapes. He makes a run for it out to the parking garage. But then he sees a shadowy figure. But it's not Batman. It's the Phantasm. And he's out to kill the bad guys. He says, Your angel. 
angel of death awaits. The Phantom, it's Phantasm, kills Chucky Saul. <laughs> Don Knievel has successfully escaped from the Phantasm. Because Batman was spotted by some eyewitnesses at the scene of the crime, everyone thinks that Batman killed this criminal. Councilman Arthur Reeves wants to put a stop to this. Meanwhile, at Stately Wayne Manor. Bruce Wayne, who's really Batman, is having a party. Yeah, there's all these women macking on Bruce Wayne. I gotta go brood. And he goes and looks at his parents' painting. Oh, this again. What, did something happen to your parents, Bruce? And he thinks about the past. Years ago, he was off brooding at a cemetery. He was young and brooding. And he was visiting his dead parents. But he heard someone talking in a happy tone at a cemetery. It's this attractive young woman. Yes? I was just talking to the giving tree. She's like, I know who you are. You're Bruce Wayne. This is my mom. She's dead and I'm dealing with it. I talked to my parents. What'd you say? I made a vow. To be Batman. No. Oh, oh, damn it. Bruce. Remember your vow to be miserable. In this extended flashback, we also see him on his first crime-fighting mission. He was struggling to find an identity, and he had not found it yet. Oh, that's good. I'm the worst shot in the mafia. <laughs> I don't know why I ever joined organized crime. My name is Stu, by the way. <laughs> See, this is how things fall off the back of trucks. His life is endangered, but he's going to get some really cheap stereo equipment. Yep. I shall call myself Hammer Man. And they shall say, please, Hammer, hurt them. <laughs> I'll call myself the Truck Stopper. <laughs> A few days later, he's in the backyard practicing his jujitsu. Who should show up but the lady? She's like, it's been three days, you didn't call. I thought I'd just break into your property. And hi ya! Look at that, I can do this too. <laughs> Why don't we just kiss each other here? On the lawn, like rich people do. He moves really, really fast. They have talked together for a total of two minutes. <laughs> Roma, Romaner, Romaner. I do not know what that means. Pro Marner, the... Marner. I can't read my own writing, folks. Back in the present, Buzz Borowski, another criminal element, goes to visit the grave of Chucky Saul. You guys wait here. Whatever you say, Mr. Bronski. Mr. Bronski. Uh, Bill Bronski. <laughs> I saw him punch a hole through a cow just as he was coming down the road. When he is set upon by the Phantom. Phantasm. Your angel of death awaits. The Phantom's voice makes it sound like he should have a friend named Davey. <laughs> he runs through the cemetery as fast as his tubby little legs will carry him, but he can't outrun the Phantom. Phantasm. He falls into an open grave and is crushed by a giant tombstone. Sal Velestra finds out that Buzz died, and he's like, oh, this isn't good. I've got to be next. Batman is investigating the cemetery. Why does he need to go to the cemetery as the Batman? He's always at the cemetery mourning John Wayne. But he is spotted by Andrea Beaumont, and she puts things together. Wayne, Batman, Bruce? There's another flashback to the Gotham World's Fair. It's their first date. Bruce sees a car he really, really likes, and he starts thinking. Bruce, I'm talking to you. I've got an idea for a mobile. Just don't <laughs> interrupt me. Andrea introduces Bruce to Mr. Beaumont. Her father. Uh, don't mind me, I was just leaving. Let so. me give you your wedgie and then you can be on your way. <laughs> Things are going great until a Mr. Velestra arrives. Mr. Velestra has an appointment. At least it's not Mr. Olestra, because <laughs> then I would be getting explosive diarrhea. And he has the unmistakable clothing and hat of a gangster. Is my shirt too big or is that my flesh crawling? Is my shirt too big or do I have chronic wasting disease? <laughs> Outside, some thugs are attacking a man. Oh no, please, I think of my family. I got a three bambinos. Whoa, Bruce has some moves. Bruce continues to struggle with the shape that his alter ego will take. That mail order drawing course <laughs> did me no good. Sure, I could draw a pirate and a turtle, but I can't craft an identity for myself. Bruce proposes to Andrea. I'm no good at this. Is my pocket too small or is there a thing in it? <laughs> 
hope it's a blood diamond because blood comes from the heart. <laughs> Ding! He's now the Batman. Old Mr. Valestra visits the ruins of the Gotham World's Fair. It is the lair of the Joker. Me, Casa Nostra, as Sue Casa Nostra. <laughs> Valestra says, you gotta help me. The Batman's coming to murder me. I'll give you $5 million if you protect me. The Joker says, all right, sure, I'll help you. Or something fancy like that and laughs a lot. Batman is visiting his old friend. And she seems to tip her hat that she knows his secret. The only one in this room controlled by his parents is you. <laughs> I need to just... Now the Phantasm is ready to kill Mr. Valestra. The Phantom. Phantasm. Stalks up on the unsuspecting Valestra. But he discovers that Valestra is already dead. The Joker killed him. And now the Joker knows that it's not the Batman, but it's this Phantom. Phantasm. That's been killing all the crime guys. Batman encounters the Phantom. Phantasm. Phantasm, whatever. But the police are there. They've come to arrest Batman. Prepare for tear gas. You don't need tear gas when it comes to Batman. All you need to do is talk about his parents. Yeah. He loses his mask. What's he gonna do? The police are closing in. He is rescued by Andrea Beaumont. Get in, Bruce. In another flashback, we see that Mr. Beaumont owes Mr. Valestra a lot of money. This time tomorrow, we'll have the money or I'll have your heart in my head. That's right, this time tomorrow I propose. And you better say yes, because I want a June wedding, and it's May. The money's tied up in investments. Could take weeks to free up. The money's in your house and in Martini's house. It's not in a vault somewhere. Beaumont and his daughter flee the country. Dad was able to parlay the money he embezzled into a fortune. And by parlay, I mean to speak in French. <laughs> and they have sex! Cartoon sex, which happens off screen. But you can imagine it. it's probably lots of like or tentacles. There's also that possibility. <laughs> She's not wearing no pants. That's what I like to see in my <laughs> cartoons. So you must love Porky Pig. Porky Pig, Donald Duck, all of the pantsless legends of old. Yep. The Joker visits Arthur What's his name? Councilman Reeves' house. He's like, hey. Nowhere near as cute as Bat Boy. The Bat Boy? <laughs> Found in cave. <laughs> the Councilman and his wacky pal. I really hope in the next Star Wars movie when Luke Skywalker speaks, he does it with this voice. <laughs> oh, Princess Leia. What a delight to see you. Oh, thanks for bringing back my lightsaber. <laughs> <laughs> Later on, Arthur is in the hospital because of the Joker's laughing poison. Turns out Reeves and Beaumont had some shady dealings together as well, and Reeves ratted Beaumont out to the mob. He's put away in an asylum, and they're like, he won't calm down anymore. Out of the fairgrounds, the Joker looks like he's going to have sex with a robot. What do you say, hon? Feeling the old electricity tonight? <laughs> Luckily, we don't get to see that. Or unluckily, I don't know. The Phantasm comes for the Joker. It turns out it's not Andrea's father, as was suspected. It's Andrea. She and the Joker fight. Joker turns on a big, powerful fan. She almost gets sucked into it, but the Batman comes by in his little bat scooter, and he rescues her. <laughs> Laws of physics defied. She hits her smoke cloud and gets out of there. Batman and the Joker decide to fight in this kind of model Gotham City. The Joker says, ha ah, hoo -ee -ee. I have bombs all over this place and I'm gonna blow it sky high in five minutes. He gets in a jetpack, tries to fly away. Batman stops him. They crash. Oh great, now we're both gonna die. Andrea comes by. She and the B Joker teleport away. Everything starts exploding. Some people just want to see the World's Fair burn. And Batman escapes through a sewer. I'll escape via the poo-poo water. Bruce is unwinding at the end of the day, covered in a bunch of sewer stench. Alfred, the amount of wee-wee and caca I've encountered today has been staggering. Batman is depressed. Andrea is dead. And he sees something glittering out there in the darkness of the Batcave. Oh, it's a little present from an old friend who I guess he'll never see again. And on a boat in the distance, we see that Andrea is still alive and alone. Oh, they're all so alone. Cut to Alfred polishing 
<laughs> Batman continues to be Batman. Out there batman and I want to share with you some uh, selections from the old comic book box here ah. from back in the day. Batman's 600th appearance in Detective Comics right here. We've got the novelization of the original Batman movie from 1989. Issue number one, collector's item, Batman Legends of the Dark Knight. These are all in mint condition, by they, the way. They are? Oh, yes. Two Frank Miller classics, The Dark Knight Returns and Batman Year One. So I guess you could say that I'm a Bat fan. So as a Bat fan, how does Mask of the Phantasm stack up to the rest of the canon? Did this feel like a movie to you, or did it feel like a long TV show? It really seemed like a long TV show to me, and that's really what it was originally going to be. And so it really felt as though there wasn't enough heft or weight to it. I liked the style of the artwork, yeah. but the animation seems very cheaply made. When you say the animation is shoddy, but you like the style, how do you differentiate the two? The animation is how the figures move. Mm -hmm and how motion is represented, the style is the still life. Not a visual feast once action happens. Yeah, it's not a bad movie. No. There's one very annoying, very large plot hole, mm -hmm. and that is, how does she have the ability to do this? <laughs> There's a button on her hand. That's not good enough. Where does she get these powers and abilities from? They're never explained, and we don't even see the full scope of what her abilities are or what they do. You get one little bit of the beginning where she proves that she knows jujitsu. But the Phantasm never does jujitsu. She does have skills of some sort. Of some sort. She has a gas cloud. She can apparently transport instantaneously between two spaces. She's impervious to harm. But why and how? I'm not a stickler for explaining things in superhero movies, but yeah, that seems like a pretty big thing. It came out right after Batman Returns. That would be the Penguin Catwoman one. I really hated that movie. It's not that good. I was fine with it at the time, but that's back before I realized it didn't have to be fine. And it was right before the uh, first Schumacher movie, which, of course, we couldn't compare it to, but I think Schumacher was comparing his movie to this because he would famously say on set, remember, we're doing a cartoon. Okay. And this cartoon seems less cartoony than the two Schumacher movies. And I think this cartoon is better than Batman 2 through 4 of yeah. the original run. And I'd say it's comparable to Batman 3 of the most recent trilogy. One thing that you kind of want to see some of in a Batman story is Commissioner Gordon. Mm -hmm. I believe he has one line in this movie. You want him, you get him. I'll have no part of it. He's very underutilized. Let's talk about this portrayal of the Joker. It is voiced by Mark Hamill of Star Wars fame. That's a movie that perhaps some of you have heard of. If you haven't, check it out. He was also in Corvette Summer. What do you think? He's a blast. A lot of people count him as the um, the second best after Ledger. It gets a little annoying when the character is just giggling and, c and cackling all the time. Which is why Heath Ledger's performance of that character is such a breath of, not fresh air, a breath of rotten air. <laughs> it really brings that character alive in a totally new way. And I know we're not talking about that movie. No, but... no, we're talking about Batman. This right. is the episode we talk about Batman. Yeah. I like the fact that it treated Bruce Wayne as a human being and they allowed him to have sex. Just like any other single person occasionally. If you'll do me a favor, I'd like you to complete this saying. Jingle bells, Batman smells, Robin laid an egg. Batmobile lost its wheel and... The Joker got away. No, that's incorrect. That's not the way that I learned it when I was growing up. It was Batmobile lost its wheel, and Commissioner lost his leg. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. That rhymes with egg. Away doesn't rhyme with egg. It's not even a slant rhyme. It's true, but the Joker doesn't care. <laughs> we'll leave it up to the viewers. Uh, were any of you raised with the line, the Commissioner lost his leg, or is it just something my brothers made up? Yeah. I don't know. You tell me. This little pocket of Milwaukee <laughs> is where the Commissioner lost his leg. It's like Minnesotans and the Grey Duck. Oh, yeah. Duck, duck, Grey Duck. Yeah. <laughs> it's Duck, Duck, Goose, Minnesota. It's, yeah, it is. Final thoughts on Batman, Mask of the Phantasm. It was phantasmic. Well, despite whatever that was, you should go check out our website, welcometothebasementshow.com. There is a 
lot of episodes that we've done, in fact, all of them, and a PayPal donation button that you can click on and you can throw a few dollars our way. If you like the show, think of it like a tip jar. Think of us as like movie baristas. Or barristers? Is that the male version? I've never heard the male version. It's like ballerina. No, but a barrister is a lawyer. A barrister is a lawyer. I know yeah. a barrister is a lawyer, <laughs> but what is the male version of barista? Help us out, folks. They're all baristas. You're all a barista. barista. Thank you. Anyway, one of our donors is Ashley, who writes, Welcome to the Basement is my favorite show ever. It has made me watch films in a different way and it inspired me to finally try filmmaking myself. P.S. All the ladies seem to like Craig, but I think Matt is a babe. I like them odds. To find out who the rest of our donors are and to see the contents of our mailbag, which I got right back here behind my back, you can watch Welcome to the Basement Unboxing, which is going to be coming out this Friday. Check it out. And now it's time for Seen It. Seen It! <laughs> The theme for tonight's scene is one we've never done before. It's Craig hasn't seen it. These are movies that I've seen and he hasn't. We'll see if you can participate in the conversation anyway. Oh, I'm pretty good. I can fake a lot of things. Jaime de Nobrega writes, What did you guys think of Inherent Vice? Seen it. Not seen it. I've followed Paul Thomas Anderson down every crazy rabbit hole that he's led me down. Up until now, he's always led me back to the surface. And this time... He left me down there fumbling around in the dark. Hmm. I'm not sure if it's because the source material is too dense and untranslatable to cinema. I'm not sure if it's just the performances or it just didn't all come together. I'm not sure if it's Joanna Newsom's spaced out narration where she sounds like someone at a poetry slam. I know it's going to be a daunting journey. No one's ever attempted filming a Thomas Pynchon book. And if you look at Paul Thomas Anderson, he will go four or five years between movies. After The Master, he took a year and a half to transform a Thomas Pynchon book into film. It's like, it, it seems impossible. If anyone can do it, he can, but... Sometimes I feel like I need to go back and see this again and see what I missed. But at the same time, I just don't want to. I'd rather go back and watch The Master a third time. I'd rather go back and watch There Would Be Blood a fourth time. Matthew Shell writes, Have you seen Jimmy, All Is By My Side? It was the Hendrix movie I wanted, except for the fact that they couldn't use the music, but have been putting it off because of the reviews. I've been telling you that you should see this movie, and you have steadfastly refused. It never looked that interesting to me. I know they can't use the music. Andre 3000 does one hell of a Jimi Hendrix. This does not play as a standard biopic. It's almost a collage of scenes, but done in a really artful way. It doesn't feel like a mishmash. Written and directed by the fellow who won the Oscar for 12 Years a Slave. I wish I remembered his name right now. It's well worth the time to watch it. Joe Swampson writes, I want someone to eat cheese with, starring Jeff Garland, Dan Castellaneta, and my future FWB Sarah Silverman. It was okay, a bit on the depressing side. I've seen it. Have you? I have not seen it. This is another movie with a terrible title. Harkening back to what we talked about at the beginning of the show. Uh, it ends with a preposition. I want someone with which to eat cheese. Would that work better for you? No. Preposition it, boy? No, it wouldn't. <laughs> I'm not sure why I watched it. I think it's because I'm a big Jeff Garland fan. He and Sarah Silverman have zero chemistry. The movie as a whole just kind of doesn't hang together very well. I like movies where fat guys sleep with hot girls. I think those are great. I'd like to see more of them. Keel Combs writes, I would love to hear what you guys think about the debacle surrounding the interview. The debacle? Once there was a debacle yes. about the interview, a fairly mediocre comedy. I have not seen it, but I know about the debacle. It's good for a laugh. The first scene in this, the scene with Eminem, is one of the funniest scenes I've seen in a long time in a comedy. Just watch the m m scene. You probably could turn it off and you'd be fine. But what if North Korea comes for me? <laughs> Believe me, even North Korea has forgotten about this movie. It's got a lot of nice set pieces. I like the way it uses music. And then, you know, Seth Rogen shoves a drone up his ass. Does that really need to happen? No. Is it really that funny? No. So this movie's got its ups and downs. That's seen it. And that's our show. Next time we will have another animated feature. What is it going to be? What do you think it should be? Let us know in the credits. The credits. Let us know in the comments. Before we go our separate ways, I do want to make one little personal note. Recently, my wife and I lost our dearest friend, and we would like to dedicate this show to our little girl, Angel. Pretend you're famous. He's the paparazzi. <laughs>
No, but no more pictures. Ah, I hate smooth jazz. <laughs> so much come man. on man get no, into I the can't. get into the back groove the groove is like <laughs> boring a hole through my skull is my shirt too big or is that my flesh crawling 